Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the seven game main slate. We might also touch on the turbo slate uh, here for Monday, April 24. Um, interesting tournament slate once again. I did a nice little seven gamer. This is a, uh, a really cool sort of range in terms of number of games. Uh, gets a little difficult on the uh, the big 12 game slates 13 13 games or whatever um there's a, a lot of guys a lot of arms and um a lot of variants certainly in baseball in these seven gamers uh, i think they're they're decent sized cash slates generally and cool tournament slates you can always get different on shorter slates and this is kind of the range where we don't have to be overly concerned with uh, with ownership we can still play uh, a lot of teams that we'd like to get to and not be terribly worried uh, that we're going to be you know duped in tournaments or anything like that uh, it's not to say we shouldn't keep that that at the forefront we're definitely going to have some ownership um, spots to be aware of today notably the angels against ken waldachuk uh, perhaps some Miami or some Atlanta against Miami and Eddie Cabrera, and we always want to be maybe Arizona uh, and and Kansas City could see some ownership come to this day this game as well. We always want to be aware, of course, of ownership on the mound, and that's why we mostly go through in these breakdowns the the pitcher and ownership projections uh, or fantasy point projections and ownership projections for pitchers. Uh, that's how we mostly want to start, and who do we want to target, who do we want to play, and the aggregate projections that we have at TrueDFS, that gives us a, a really good baseline for our initial research and how we want to consider constructing teams for that particular slate. And for seven gamers, uh, I think that it gives us an opportunity, perhaps not necessarily today with uh, Spencer Strider on the mound, but we can usually get a little bit different. We can mix in uh, a lot of different pitchers, and as, as we see here in sort of the range just below Strider, the Montgomery Gray Cobb Lynn Bassett range, uh, all these guys pretty much projecting at the exact same number, certainly Lance Lynn a little bit lower in the bad matchup against Toronto, but the ownership numbers coming in Roughly flat as well. Uh, certainly the chalkiest down here is going to be Bassett um, getting the White Sox. Maybe a little elevated in that ownership number. So, um, But these seven game slates are an interesting starting point or an interesting range at, for us to really take advantage of some granularity in the in the aggregate projections. And with the most accurate projections... In the industry, uh, I think that's what the the aggregates really offer us here, both in in fantasy points and ownership. So, um, like these seven gamers a lot. You can you can play cash with them. Um, you can still get to some really good spots, and they're good for tournaments as well. So, um, as a, a brief overview, I mentioned we're probably going to have some chalk on LA. Uh, Johnny Brito gets the Twins again. Hopefully, he can. Um, well, depending on which side of the game you're on, uh, be a little bit better than his last start against the Twins. Interesting tournament game here, Detroit and Milwaukee. Um, potentially playable arms and potentially playable stacks as well. Uh, so I think we'll uh, we'll get into the numbers there a little bit. Uh, Atlanta and Miami I mentioned as well. Um, probably no Eddie Cabrera. He's got some pretty serious problems against the very potent offense and a very potent arm on the mound. So um, Atlanta is probably going to be a, I would guess, a three dollar favorite or something. Perhaps even north of that today. Probably targeting mostly pitching on in the uh, first first game here, White Sox in Toronto. Um, and let's just get into the breakdown. Let's uh, let's take a look at who we've got on the mound. Lance Lynn going for the Sox, and Bassett on the other side. Get to him in a sec. Um, 8400 for Lance Lynn. It's fine price tag. And there, I mean, Lance Lynn's been pretty decent in his last two starts, I believe. Um, did have that 
pretty serious clunker against the Giants. Um, and I suppose I made it up that he was good in his last start. Still got uh, pieced apart pretty good. Five and a third, five earned and ten hits. Did have seven Ks against the Phillies in his last. Um, start before that, he got Minnesota on a really strong bounce. Went full six innings with ten Ks and just gave up three. So um, the run suppression really hasn't been there quite yet for Lance Lynn. That's what we kind of expect. Now he's got a four and a half ERA, three and a half xFIP. So perhaps a little bit of raw run suppression regression coming for him because the whip is still good. Strikeout rate is still good, still throws strikes, still stays off the barrel and doesn't walk people. So perhaps a little bit noisy. I think that's mostly coming from the homers. He's he's gotten into left-handers a little bit too much here in the early going. Um, and pretty much everybody in the White Sox rotation is giving up homers. Uh, Michael Kopech, Dylan Cease, um, who else do they have? Uh, certainly Lance Lynn. Uh, everybody over there is is just giving up the long ball, and that's been a problem for them. So it's put their offense behind the eight ball quite a bit here. And now Toronto, we definitely don't want to be messing with them in general. They're a, a very potent lineup, of course. And we can scroll over here and check out their numbers against righties this season. 600 PAs, so this number is just about converged. This is probably where Toronto's going to end up. 22.5% uh, K rate, 9% walk rate. 166 ISO, perhaps a little low there. But a 326 Woba and a neutral ground ball to fly ball, they're going to want... They're going to be hitting the baseball hard. Full 31% hard contact rate. It's a good aggregate number. Less on the line drives than you'd really like to see for a hard contact rate that high. But um, encouraging because the Blue Jays often, or in the past, have made a lot of soft contact. So they're hitting the baseball cleaner so far in the early going against right-handers um, in aggregate. And, and that's looking pretty strong. Homer to fly ball rate uh, at about 12%. This is okay. Um, I mean, ideally you want to see this at, at like 15%, but uh, very few teams are going to hit that sort of aggregate number um, overall. But against right-handers, very strong numbers for a predominantly right-handed lineup. Now, of course, they do have Dalton Varsho who has solidified the left-handed presence there for the Jays. And that's really the, the biggest threat from the left side of the plate that we're going to um, need to be aware of. So initially, I, I think that you know just the raw strikeout matchup is certainly not great for Lance Lynn, but he's fantastic against the right side. 28% K rate, doesn't walk anybody. Hard contact, a little... A little Elevated as well, but um, nothing too terrible here because he's got a full 18.5% soft contact rate as well. So it's um, a lot of medium, mostly medium type contact to the right side. And all of the hard contact is really coming to the lefties where he, he gets on the barrel a little bit more. 34% hard contact there with a 197 ISO. Strikeout rate drops down to about 22%, which is a tick or so below league average. So mostly attackable with lefties. Now they do have Brandon Belt over there. Uh, they do have a guy like, um, of course, Varsho we mentioned. They do have Kevin Biggio and um, like a, a, a Kiermeyer down at the bottom of the lineup. So they, they've got a couple of guys, not a lot of upside from them necessarily, but Hard contact rates to left-handers. I mean, this is 1.9 homers per nine. It's a big number to anybody. I don't care who you're throwing it to. Um, and either one of those guys down there at the bottom of the list, and of course Darsho and Belt as well, they can make make things a little difficult for Lance Lynn over here. So it's reasonable if you'd like to go after some Toronto. Um, kind of a low median projection so far and very early runs for Lance Lynn here at 84. And just 10% ownership, I think, given where the numbers are at the moment, this seems reasonable. 
Uh, with 8,400, we're not all that thrilled with a 14-point outing from him on DK. And ownership projection is, is commensurately, you know, pretty deflated here. Um, you know, that said, overall, this is a pretty okay matchup for him. Um because he's so excellent against right-handers. So they're going to be right-handed heavy. Certainly their best hitters all hit from the right side. Springer, Bichette, Vladdy, uh, Matt Chapman. So uh, the power is there for the Blue Jays, but I think I would probably side with Lance Lynn in a lot of scenarios, uh, and I think certainly more than 1 in 10 scenarios here. So I think there might be a little bit of value we could squeeze out of this ownership projection here um and maybe coming in at least with the field uh and perhaps coming in a little bit over we'll see what the what the number does throughout the day um but i think this is an attackable tournament spot at, at pretty low ownership we are and we're gonna need to get different if we're playing strider and like the angels or something on the other side chris bassett eight thousand. he's gonna be very chalky higher Median projection so far and commensurately higher ownership. Um, I just noticed that I've got to. I'm gonna, let's do that. Oh, it's driving me crazy. Uh, higher ownership projection on Bassett right now. And in his case, stuff really to both sides of the plate, he's a little bit better against lefties, but um, way lower than Lance Lynn. And at just a $400 difference. I think this is a fine tournament pivot to get to Lance Lynn instead of Bassett. The strikeout matchup is basically identical. 22.6% to righties for the Blue Jays in 600 PAs. 22.9% against righties in 650 PAs for the Sox. So uh, they're going to hit for a little bit less power. 2% is 2% though. In, in the ISO category, and 2% in WOBA is 2% in WOBA. So you can't really fake that. They're going to hit a lot more ground balls, of course, and hit uh, far fewer balls hard and on the barrel. But soft contact rate is is identical here, and, and mostly in the same type of range are the, are the Sox uh, as the Blue Jays. So uh, I think this is an interesting spot to get to some of the White Sox as well. They're... they're very attainable price wise. Let's get to uh, we'll probably at the end talk about this little turbo slate. Um, price wise, very attainable over here. Luis Robert, you got to pay for him, but Andrew Vaughn, three thousand. Eloy's really seen the baseball, thirty five hundred. Like this play a lot. Just uh, pretty much against anybody until this price comes up. Uh, he's a good hitter over here. He, he I think last year, uh, not in the power metrics necessarily, but he hit 310 or 315 or something like that. He's a good hitter, and 3,500 is too cheap for him. Um, Grandal has shown a couple of power spots. Once again, he is from both sides, and we generally don't want to be going after Bassett with uh, guys that have high strikeout rates, but Bassett's breaking stuff isn't all that excellent, and that's really been Grandal's weakness his entire career. Now, he does have the good curveball, and that's how he can induce a good bit of swing and miss from the left side. That's why we see a 24.5% K rate there. Um, but still susceptible in, in giving up a little bit of power to the lefties, 189 ISO, with just a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball, translates to 1.6 homers per nine. Now, overall, the numbers for Bassett are, are good in aggregate. Over his last 200 innings, this is a full season's worth of, of data. Now, he's had his ups and downs, of course, but for the most part, the fastball mix with the sinker cutter, four-seamer not good. Wish he'd really just dump this pitch. Four-seamer cutter, or excuse me, sinker cutter are, are pretty okay. It's the lack of a good changeup uh, that really is leading to a, a decent bit of the power. The swing and miss, as I mentioned with the curveball, is there against both sides of the plate. A little bit lower against righties because the slider's not very good. So uh, kind of surprising here that the slider is so bad given that the cutter is pretty good. Uh, but doesn't really have a lot of pure whiff stuff against the right side of the plate. And a lot of the better hitters for Chicago are coming from the right side of the plate as well. So uh, I think this is an interesting tournament stack as well. Getting to some of the socks here and getting some leverage off of um, what appears at the moment to be a quite inflated ownership percentage on Chris Bassett. We'll see how it 
fleshes out throughout the rest of the day. But um, I think I'm probably on the other side of this game here. Of course, Toronto's offense naturally more potent, right? But um, price-wise, I think we can get to some of the socks here. And I like Lance Lynn on the mound. I think this is an interesting tournament spot. And given this run total, um, you would kind of expect to be laying a little bit more than yeah, what it, whatever this is, you know, but I mean, dollar sixty. Um, and getting plus thirty five, I'm not super crazy about that. Um, think this needs to be a little bit higher for me to go take a punt on the socks. But we're getting into a uh, kind of intriguing value range here, so I think this is an interesting tournament game. Give me a little bit of the socks, but um, also wouldn't be surprised if Lance Lynn's run suppression issues kind of hover here at the surface against a really potent lineup. Uh, very expensive stack to get to over here on Toronto. Bichette still 57, Vladdy 57, that's fine for him, but Bichette, eh, perhaps not so much. 52 for Matt Chapman, he's been excellent this season. Um, so given his his performance, this is fine, but generally uh, quite overpriced for his historical um Historical output, I would say. Everybody else pretty attainable. Springer down here at 46 is a damn good price, I think. So, interesting tournament game here. Uh, I would think I would side mostly with the Sox. But uh, let's move on to Miami and Atlanta. Strider on the mound. We'll get to him in a sec. 7,800 for Eddie Cabrera. As I mentioned, he's got a bad fastball. Uh, bad fastball mix, as a matter of fact. Throwing the sinker a little bit more. Um, but it, this is a terrible idea. Sinker is just a pretty bad pitch. Certainly, if... It, it's going to be bad if your four-seamer is, is bad as well. Now, he has gas. If he can spot this fastball, he could be okay. But the problem is he's got a 13% walk rate, and this is over 89 in the third innings here. Like, kid cannot throw strikes, can't throw strike one and get ahead of hitters. And that's going to put him in a really bad spot uh, against the Braves over here. Good, potent offense, pretty much 1-9. to nine. Uh, They've got some kind of paperweights down at the bottom of the lineup a little bit, but uh, very strong, and each one of these guys over here can get to you. Um, but he's putting too many people on base for free, and we're not going to deal with that against... I mean, you put Acuna on base, he's, he's going to steal three bases on you um, and score twice in the first inning somehow. It, like, guy does it every single day. Now, I'm not sure his price exactly. Yeah, he's still at 6500 and I think this is still a playable price. Uh, he's just been a stone lock in cash. And with a very high probability that Eddie puts him on base, 16% walk rate against right-handers, uh, and some power as well, 212 ISO with a 1.7 homers per nine. He's got some serious problems here, despite the fact that he's got a good secondary pitch arsenal. Four-seamer... And, and the sinker combination here, it, it's really bad. We're going to talk about this every single start for Eddie because uh, he still can't throw strikes. In his first couple of starts this season, uh, he's also been very attackable. The first three were not good, and the walks were still there. Walked six guys against the Mets in his first start, seven in his second start against the Mets again. Now, he, he did tone that down against the Phillies in his third start, and was able to survive because the the good breaking stuff can let him run deep into games if he's not elevating his own pitch count by putting people on base. The strikeout stuff is not going to be there because he can't throw that many strikes. In aggregate, does have a strikeout rate that is very attractive, but he has to be able to work off of the four seamer and throw 40% of his of his arsenal, 35 here for a strike, and he at the moment just can't do it. Now, he is suppressing power to left-handers. Um, so the Matt Olson territory has been striking out a crap load. It seems like it's a pretty regular sequence this season where Acuna walks or singles in, in the first inning, steals second base, then Matt Olson promptly strikes out afterward with Austin Riley coming in and picking up the garbage and hitting a ball over the wall. Um, Sean Murphy's shown quite a bit of power here in the early going as well. Elevated price tag for him, but... This is a high upside stack, so if you want to get to these top four here, even Albie's got a $500 price bump today at 4800 If you want to play all five of these guys, you're going to have to make some pretty disgusting decisions on the mound, and you're, you might have to 
do something you might not want to do, like a Josie Suarez against a sticky A's, Tommy Henry against a you know, bad Royals, but um, worrisome down here for sure. Uh, Matt Boyd against Brewers, I mean, y- yikes. Um, so if you want to get to the Braves, they're going to be hard to get to, and that's going to keep their ownership down for sure. But uh, you'll still see, I would imagine, a good 10 12% on pretty much all of these guys. Um, can't really target Eddie Cabrera. Um, as a as a piece we can use on the mound, his walk rate's just too high. Spencer Strider at ten nine. I mean, we're just gonna we're gonna play him and we're gonna get a, a boatload of him uh, when we build teams. He is once again, if you are playing cash today, um, he's a stone lock. You just don't get cute with a guy that's got a thirty nine percent K rate uh, to both sides of the plate. In his last start, he was fantastic again. Um, Went a full six innings, did walk three. So the, the control has really always been a little bit of an issue for Strider. Uh, it's not that he's not throwing strike one. It's just that he's throwing it so damn hard. Um, the slider is a very hard slider. And this is really where he gets a little bit wild with it. It's got a lot of swing and miss. Don't get me wrong. But um, this is where the control issues kind of creep up a little bit later in counts. So he is susceptible a little bit with elevating the pitch count and and walking people. Um, but the strikeout stuff is there. In each of his four starts this season, he struck out nine in six, five, five, and six innings against Washington, San Diego, Cincinnati, and the Padres once again. So um, he's been excellent. And the Marlins over here, as we mentioned in the early going, uh, or in the opening, 24.5% K rate so far, 90 WRC+, plus, not hitting for any power normally, um, and hitting a lot of ground balls. So this is very encouraging for Spencer Strider. Now, some of these guys from the Marlins over here could get the baseball on the line, notably Luis Arise or Jazz Chisholm. Good line drive hitters, and those are really the two favorites. We don't want to be messing with pretty much anybody else. Um if Strider starts walking people, there are a couple of guys in here that don't strike out all that much, notably Gene Segura and Luis Arise. So um, these two guys could really turn the lineup over for them and make it a little more difficult. They're patient hitters, they're veteran hitters, and they're not going to beat themselves. Now, Gene Segura is going to hit about 28 ground balls per fly ball, but he's not going to whiff a whole hell of a lot. He's going to put the ball in play, and that does – decrease Spencer Strider's overall strikeout upside. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting really granular with it here, but we're not going to make any, uh, you know, any cute decisions with Strider on the mound. We're just going to target the Marlins. This is a pretty low upside lineup as it is. And we're going to target the Braves and go after Eddie Cabrera. Okay. Interesting tournament game here for the Tigers and the Brewers. Uh, Matt Boyd on the mound, 6,600. As I mentioned, he's kind of been okay. And he looks, it looks good um, that he is not getting just completely pieced apart. And against the Guardians in his last start, he was very, very serviceable. And he had a no-hitter going, I believe, into the fifth inning. Um, Perhaps the fourth inning, but, uh, I mean, which isn't all that impressive. You know, a lot of guys can go three innings, four innings, or whatever. Uh, He did only last five innings, but in his first two starts, he lasted four and a third, four and two-thirds. So the strikeout stuff, we're still waiting um, to see again for Matt Boyd. And, of course, these are limited samples. Like, in his heyday, before he got hurt, uh, he had a 28, 29% K rate. Always been an issue. Power to the right side of the plate and strikeout stuff to the right side of the plate. However, so far, eking a little bit of value out of this changeup, which will suppress some of the right-handed power. So um, he's always been elite against lefties. And in the short sample here, 43 hitters, 11 and two-thirds, that really hasn't changed. Uh, But the swing and miss stuff against righties is still a bit of a question mark. Um, So far, a 3-0 ERA, very short sample here, 27 and a third. But a 5-0 XFIP nearly, and we're going to see some some normalization of these numbers. Either the ERA is going to come up or the XFIP is going to come down, which makes him an interesting tournament play. Um, 
because there's variance when we're looking for regression in some of the numbers. Uh, unfortunately, so far, he's got a huge walk rate to the right side of the plate, 20%, and that's a problem. Um, it's not that he's throwing strike, not throwing strike one necessarily, but he can't throw strikes two and three. So um, here in the early going, still having a little bit of trouble with the control, which is going to elevate the pitch count for him, which would be worrisome for us. We'd like to see him be able to go a full six innings here. Um, in this particular matchup against the Brewers, I think that's reasonable to assume. In a very short sample so far, 32.5% K rate and 150 PAs for the Brewers against lefties this year. 64 WRC+. Plus. This is awful. Uh, it will correct as the sample gets larger, but um, you know, this could be one of those days if, if Matt Boyd starts walking people. But uh, I think this makes for an interesting tournament piece um, down here at the bottom at very low ownership so far. This is a high median projection for this ownership. There is a big delta between these two numbers, uh, and there's some exploitability in that projected ownership so far. So at 6600 I think this is a very nice price tag to take a shot on some Matt Boyd, um, really the best hitters for the Brewers are from the left side. That's Yelich. Don't tell anybody I said he's one of their best hitters anymore. Um, power hitters, though. Rowdy Telez, of course, hitting from the left side. Jesse Winker, of course, hitting from the left side as well. Um, they will platoon. Brian Anderson has shown a little bit of pop. So they've got plenty of righties over here that can make it difficult on him. They could go with seven at least, or even eight righties in the lineup. They may even give Yelich a day off um, in a really bad matchup for him. And they could go full nine guys from the right side of the plate here, um, which really would take me off of some of the Matt Boy, but I still think that this is a, a nice price tag for him. And the Brewers, even with all of their platoon bats over here, like Mike Brasso still strikes out a crap load. So, um, so does Luke Voigt. All of these guys, Joey Weimer, Blake Perkins, young hitters down here. All of these guys are are still striking out a lot as, as the early numbers show, that 32.5% K rate. So not hitting for any power, 2.25 ground balls per fly ball so far. That's an outrageously high number. Um, and that really decreases their overall upside as a lineup. So I think this is an interesting tournament piece. We'll see where the ownership ends up fleshing out by the end of the day. But this is a fine play, I think, to add some Matt Boyd into your pool. Certainly more than 6%. Uh, Colin Ray on the mound for the Brewers. As I mentioned, he's getting his third start now uh, through the rotation here. And while I believe what was that Brandon Woodruff is on the shelf, um, got picked apart a little bit in his last start as I alluded to against Seattle, went five innings, just the two strikeouts. Uh, control is fine, but gave up um, four earned runs on five hits. So we don't really uh, – we still need to see a little bit more from, from Colin Ray. Um, that first start against the Padres where his slider was excellent, um, five and two-thirds with six Ks. Well, the Padres have been striking out a crap load against uh, right-handed pitching so far this season, but – so have the Tigers, right? Um, now let's not uh, let's not kid ourselves. 600 PAs, 25% K rate. This is going to be what the Tigers are for the rest of the year, uh, almost certainly. 120 ISO, 270 WOBA is really really bad. Now they are making a lot of hard contacts, just that they're not making it all that often. Um, this number is sort of a, a reflection of contact. Well, when made, <laughs> let's put it that way. So uh, 71 WRC plus is uh, undoubtedly uh, one of the worst numbers in the league. It'll be this low probably all season. Uh, they're even worse against left-handers somehow, um, dropping their, in, a, in additional 150 PAs, dropping their WRC plus down to 67. So uh, they've been awful um, as they've been really for the last, several seasons, and that's really not going to change this year. Can you include some Colin Ray into your pools because of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, throwing the, throw the kitchen sink here and really not getting a whole lot of whiff stuff. But again, this is a very short sample, and he had 6Ks and 2Ks. So, um, you know, not a lot you can take out of that. But... First pitch strike rate hovering right at 60% is fine for a guy with a 
um, a pretty long history bouncing around several leagues and one that really hasn't been a mainstay in a major league rotation or on a major league staff for that matter uh, since 2018. Uh, been mostly in the minors and abroad. So um, a lot of concern, well, not concern, but trepidation, I should say, with uh, Colin Ray on the mound. 7000 is an int- intriguing price tag, undoubtedly, against the Tigers. And this is a seven-game slate. You can do whatever you want. You can certainly attack Detroit. Um, I think I would side, if I had to choose, definitely with Matt Boyd over here. He's just got more history as an equitable starter in the bigs, even though he does have problems with right-handers. Um, and even, as I mentioned at at the outset, we might be able to get to some Detroit pieces here today. Some of these left-handers, they hit righties incredibly hard. Nick Maton, um, in particular, they'll probably lead him off. He's going to strike out a ton, but um, Riley Green makes pretty good contact against righties. Not a lot of raw power upside from Riley, but you know he's got some pop. Kerry Carpenter, for sure, he's probably their best power hitter. Zach McKinstry, he's actually been pretty damn good over the last couple of years. Last year with the Cubs, uh, he's a pretty streaky hitter. And at 2,600, if they have him here in the five hole, uh, I think this is a very nice value piece and could serve to allow you to get to some more expensive stacks and probably pretty contrarian. Um, you know, We'll see our, where his ownership comes in later, but I think he's a very valuable play right here. At 2,600, you need 10, 12 points out of that and uh, in tournaments, that is. And that's a very attainable number for McKinstry here. Um, got good down-the-line power. He's got some pop also. Um, so I think this is an intriguing stack for the Tigers. Don't tell anybody I said this, but uh, there's a couple of games on occasion we'll be able to get to the Tigers throughout the season, and this may very well be one of them. Now, if they get shut out and no hit, you know, don't hold it against me. But um, still some pop. Of course, from the right side as well. Torque down here, 2,700 has has pop, but he, you know strikes out a bunch. Uh, Akil Badu, we'll see. What, they've been experimenting with him at the top of the lineup. Strikes out too much. You know, the heavy, heavy fly ball hitter. So, um, and Javi Baez is a, a ghost of his earlier self. So, um, intriguing price prices here for sure, and that'll allow you to get to. Uh, a strider so it may elevate their ownership a little bit but let's like who are we kidding this is a tigers um they're not going to be played all that often or all that much so kind of siding with the tigers here i can't believe i just talked myself into that but hey they've only lost 51 52 percent of their games uh, no not even uh 49 of their game 48 percent so far um you know they're they're not 100 games under 500 yet so uh, maybe we can get to a little bit of the Tigers in an attackable spot against Colin Ray so far. Uh, really nothing in the arsenal that's terribly overwhelming, so to speak, so far. Uh, 10% barrel rate here in the early going in, what is that, the 42 hitters? Um, eh, all right, you know, we'll uh, we'll see. We'll see where these numbers flesh out for him. Um, probably not long for the rotation once Brandon Woodruff comes back, but uh, I think an attackable spot for for the Tigers, I, and as I said, you can get to some of the righties from the Brewers, but would probably side with Matt Boyd a little bit there. I think there's some value we could squeeze out of those numbers. Uh, okay, Johnny Brito on the mound for the Yankees against the Twins, um, getting his second look at them, and kind of expect him to be uh, a bit better. Um, he didn't have any of the control. It's not that he he really walked people in that start against the Twins. Um, they did like he was just up in the strike zone and they pounded him. Um, it it, it did, like he walked one batter. I mean, admittedly, he only made it two thirds of an inning before it, like they just totally jumped on him and he didn't have it. He was floating everything and that's just that happens with some guys, certainly with young pitchers. Uh, he had been pretty good in his first couple of starts. And was also serviceable in his in his start following the blow up against Minnesota. So a nice nice to see a, a strong bounce from him. Went four and a third, struck out three, did walk three. So the control a little bit, eh, you know, we notable here at 11% so far. Um, still a short sample on just 15 innings, but 11% walk rate. Eh, 
it's not great. Um, it's easier to bring this walk rate down early rather than, you know, walk in 11% of your first whatever, 250 hitters, and then bring it down later. So um, this is a big problem here at strike one. 53% is a very low number, and we need to see this up up to 60. I'm going to say this pretty much every day with everybody. Um, CSW down here of 24% so far, and that's going to leave quite a lot on the table against some big league lineups. Now, of course, the, the suppression metrics, ERA and the XFIP, they're going to be inflated because of that start. Um, but early value on the fastball mix is not good. So we have to be aware of this. Changeup has been good. Slider has been good so far. Um, but he was on the barrel a lot. And walks plus barrels plus hard contact, 37.5% so far to the right side of the plate. Uh, that's that's pretty worrisome here. He gave up a a bomb to, I think, Eddie Julian in that start. He gave one up to Carlos Correa. Um, who knows who else he gave it up to there. But pretty worrisome early sort of underlying metrics for Johnny Brito. Now, once again, he does get this same lineup that he saw two weeks ago. Um, again, so you'll expect that he is just going to be better. His stuff was bad, and I don't believe he's that bad, right? So, can we really expect another seven-run first inning from the Twins over here? I, I don't think so. Um, this lineup has also been really, really poor to start the year. They're having some problems. Uh, Trevor Larnick, unfortunately, he can't hit uh, an off-speed pitch. He's a, he's a really good fastball hitter. Um, but, so that could provide him a little bit of value against what's so far some bad a bad fastball mix against Johnny Brito, but he's got a good changeup and an okay slider so far, uh, and that is going to make it really difficult on Trevor Larning. This has been the book on him ever since a minor, so um, worrisome that he's striking out still so much on on non fastballs. Everybody else in the lineup sans the sort of I guess good first two-game stretch for Georgie Polanco. Hit a ball out yesterday. He was the only one of the Twins that did anything. Um, they got Joey Gallo. They, they still don't know what to do with him. I don't know why he's on a major league roster. Uh, he, he has a good arm <laughs> and and plays okay defense. But uh, like 35 and 40% strikeout rate is egregious. And he doesn't provide any value. Um now, Johnny Brito does have a bad fastball, but he's got, as I mentioned again, the the decent breaking stuff. Um, so that's a bad spot for Joey Gallo, but you can play him um, and, and get to some twin stacks if you'd like. Target's going to play up a little bit of lefty power as opposed to right-handed power, but it's 45 degrees, so we're not super crazy about that. Uh, and, and this lineup overall has been awful. Byron Buxton striking out a ton of here in the early going. Carlos Correa probably been their best raw hitter so far. Um, strikeout rate is low, so the guy and the guy makes contact. Max Kepler is back, 3,500. That's a playable piece for sure. Um, so probably my favorite price adjusted play here would be Kepler. I do like Trevor Larnick, but um, he's got a he's got some big holes in the swing as a young hitter. So um, I mean, as a matter of fact, their best hitter may be, may be Michael Taylor so far. Uh, Twins have been very disappointing, so I'm not super crazy about targeting Brito again. I think I'd rather side with him in this in this second look against the same lineup, certainly 45 degrees. Um, it's going to be difficult for them to get the ball up in the air and over the wall here unless Brito is just up in the strike zone and walking people. Um, I think in most scenarios we side with probably side with Brito. On the other side, we have Sonny Gray. 9,300, this is a fine tournament play again uh, with Sonny. He's been... I mean, there's variance with Sonny. We know that. We talk about this with him every start. And, but in his last three starts, he's been really good. Went seven against Houston, struck out 13. That's not going to happen again. Um, I mean, it could happen. Yankees will whiff a little bit. But had the White Sox in Boston as well. All difficult strikeout matchups. In his first start against against the Royals, he was not great. Just struck out the one. So there's the variance creeping up with Sonny. Um, but you can't hold too much against a guy in his first start of the season in early April. So um, he's been good in his last few starts. However, 
performance dropping off a little bit, just gone five innings, five innings of the last two starts with 5Ks, 7Ks uh, against the White Sox in Boston. And the price tag is elevating, So uh, as is the ownership now. Uh, we need to be aware of that. Undoubtedly, a, a high early median projection for Sonny, um, and he's going to be a, one of these pieces in the upper range if you do want to mix it in with Strider or even come off of Strider, play like a, a Sonny Gray, Lance Lynn tournament team uh, or something like that. It's a viable construction. It'll make it a little bit cheaper for you, and it'll be off the board a little bit. So something you can consider, but... We do need to be aware that a $9,300 price tag is probably a bit elevated for Sonny in general. And when we see that accompanied by some elevated ownership, um, that makes him less attractive as a tournament play. But the stuff is still great. The only real question mark here is, I guess, the sinker-slider combo not eking out a ton of value and still throwing those pitches a lot. I mean, that's 45%, 46% of the arsenal here with those two pitches um, at basically break even relative to the rest of the league. So that's maybe a little bit of um, room for improvement there. But the four-seamer and the curveball are excellent, and they really always have been. Nothing's really changed there with Sonny. Throws throws strikes. Does have a little bit of an issue getting ahead in counts, but... You know, 60%, 60%, and that's really the threshold we look for. So 30% CSW is excellent, and that's mostly because of the huge called strike rate here. This is one of the higher numbers in baseball. His swinging strike rate itself leaves some on the table at sub-10%, but the CSW, that that's the aggregate number, and strikes are strikes. So um, doesn't pitch to a hell of a lot of contact. 77% is a fine number. Suppression numbers are good. Walk numbers are, are fine with Sonny, as really, you know, have they been always. So, a buck 15 whip and a 25% K rate in aggregate. So, numbers are good, and you can go after the Yankees if you'd like to. This is also a 50-degree weather game for Sonny Gray. So, um, now, price tag is what, and, and ownership here is, is what would kind of keep me off. But, I mean, off in, like, super outsized proportions, but we can attack the Yankees here. 25% K rate against righties so far this season. 102 WRC+. plus. Yeah, they have power. And yeah, they're going to hit the baseball hard. 30 foot, but most of this is coming from Aaron Judge. Um, or even, I suppose, an Anthony Volpe at the top of the lineup now who's been pretty good. But they're striking out. 25% is 25%. So we can go after the Yankees here in the early going. And we've been targeting them in some decent spots so far. So I think it's fine. Uh, I do think the, the price and the ownership are elevated. But from a fun, fundamental perspective, it's a, it's a fine spot. It's really just lineup construction and, and balancing the ownership that you're going to have to deal with Sunday Gray. Okay, Oakland and the Angels going kind of long here, I believe. Uh, but we could probably blast through the A's pretty quickly. Uh, Ken Waldachuk on the mound, we're not, we're not going near this. Like, he, he just doesn't have it. I... It's an intriguing price tag for a guy that throws 95, um, but he can't throw for a strike, and he can't spot it. Like, the, the command of the four-seamer leaves a lot on the table, and he doesn't have any good breaking stuff that allows him to get out of a lot of holes. He pipes this four-seamer, and he gets on the barrel at a full 105 and 11% clip, and this is just way, way too high for pretty much any starter in baseball, uh, unless you are, you know, a DeGrom that's got a 10% barrel rate himself. And he's also got a strikeout rate twice as high as the, as the K rate for Ken Waldachuk. So uh, we're, we're not doing, I'm not doing this uh, on on the mound with Ken Waldachuk. Uh, I have been in, I played him a couple of times last year when he first came up. But uh, that that experiment quickly ended. Um, 305 average, 287 ISO with a 412 WOBA against the right side of the plate. It's not necessarily in, in walk rate um, that that's really getting him in trouble. It's just power right over the right over the freaking middle. Uh, 2.3 homers per nine to the righties. So you're going to see a lot of ownership come on the Angels today. Uh, Anthony Rendon at 44,000, 4100 or something like that. Um, 44 today, I guess. 
Uh, he's going to be pretty popular. They can go pretty right-handed heavy here. Of course, Taylor Ward, Mike Trout, Hunter Renfro, your big power bats. Uh, from the right side, Otani, of course, he hits lefties fine, and Waldachuk is not going to totally blow him away. Brandon Drury is probably going to be pretty popular down there at 3,600 as well. Just an 18% K rate to the left side of the plate. So a good spot for for Shohei, definitely. Uh, you can get to all of the Angels. They've got a little bit of concern behind the plate. Um, they're going to be, unfortunately, have to, having to mix in Chad Wallach and Matt Theis behind the plate. Now, each, each of those guys has hit a dinger in their respective last starts. But... Um, it's probably not going to continue. I mean, they're not going to hit one out every single game. It's a good spot for them. However, it, it will likely be Wallach tonight at 2,600. He's a cheap catcher piece. Would have to be careful of the ownership for him, but uh, he has pop, definitely. And Waldachuk, I mean, you and I could hit it over the wall against him. So um, they unfortunately lost Logan Ohapi, who's been really, really good. Probably going to lose him for the entire season I believe he has a torn labrum in his left shoulder. So uh, not great there. So they're going to have to figure this out until Max Stasi gets back uh, for the Angels. Um, but playable constructions for sure. You're going to have to make some decisions down here and mix in some of the cheaper pieces like a Zach Neto, um, a Wallach, Brandon Drury, who are going to see elevated ownership despite hitting down here at the bottom of the list. So uh, we're attacking Waldachuk definitely, and that's why we're seeing early run totals this high on the Angels. He just doesn't have it against the right side of the plate. It's going to be a dangerous spot for him. But, it, like, not that you could play him. I don't think any upside is there for him to survive more than four or five innings. Um, the K stuff is not going to be there, even though four or five innings could be serviceable uh, at this type of price tag. Um, you're taking a lot of risk there, so by all means, if, uh, if you got the stones for it, um, you know, go ahead the, the price play is fine. It's going to make you very contrarian if you're playing a chalky Atlanta with Strider or something. Um, that's okay, but uh, not for my taste. Um, I'd much rather just figure out how to get different with the Angels and and eat some of it here, even though their offense has been pretty bad. Uh, they're still only striking out 21% against lefties so far and about 200 PAs, 130 WRC+. Plus hitting for a lot of hard contact and a good bit of power here, 164 ISO. It's okay. Uh, 360 Woba is very strong. So a lot of a lot of average, 287 average as a team so far. That's a huge number. A lot of ground balls. So you'd like to see more of those go over the wall. But Trout has really been heating up. He's starting to look healthy and very comfortable at the plate again. He's been close. Um, but now the homers and the, and, the, and the doubles are starting to show up again for Trout. So really good spot for him. He's going to be probably the most popular hitter on the day or one of them, I would assume. Josie Suarez on the mound for the Angels, 5,800 for him. Also not seeing, uh, this is kind of a surprising number to me, this 17% ownership so far. Um, he leaves a lot on the table, definitely. He's got a pretty bad changeup that he's throwing a full 25% of the of the time here, uh, and a pretty, well, a pretty bad four-seamer as well, uh, I would say. At, at 35% of the time. So we're at uh, a, a good 60% of the arsenal, and these are two real bad pitches. So perhaps the ownership number isn't all that surprising, but I expected um, a $5,800 price tag and the A's on the other side to spike this number uh, pretty terribly, uh, to be quite honest. I was expecting 30%. So um, maybe that's where he ends up by the end of the day. Who knows? Because 5800 is a... It's a good price tag. But that said, if it stays this low, I think that might give us an opportunity to get contrarian with it and get to some A's pieces over here, notably like an Esturio Ruiz who's been leading off against lefties. Um, you can play a, a Jesus Aguilar, uh, 2,600 at first base if you want to do that. Jordan Diaz at 27. He's shown some pop here in the early going. Brent Rooker has cooled off quite a bit, of course, but he's still at a very playable price, 3,400. And they can get right-handed heavy here. Shea Lingaliers actually hit a bomb shot off of DeGrom yesterday. So they can get, they've got some righties here to go after Jose Suarez. Now typically, or historically, it's been lefties we wanted to get to him with. But over the last several years, and the numbers are really not changing this, 
it's been the righties in a, in a more traditional split. 170 ISO with a 273 average. It's a pretty big number. 340 WOBA against the right side. 22% K rate. Just, you know, tick or so below league average. 31% hard contact with 1.3 homers per nine to the righties. Um, he's not going to walk people, and he's not going to get on the barrel terribly often here. So he's a serviceable arm. And, and a fine tournament piece at some reduced ownership if you want to go after Oakland because they're a bad lineup. But I think in most scenarios, I might want to side with some cheaper Oakland pieces rather than getting a full 30% of Jose Suarez. For example, if this number did come in 30%, I'd almost definitely come under. At 15, I think this is okay. You could probably mix in you know, 15 to, to 20 teams of Josie Suarez if you're max entering tonight. I think that's a reasonable construction because the price tag is so low. 5,800, there's upside at the price for him to go six innings, even against the hapless athletics. So, or especially against the hapless athletics, I, sh I should say. Um, so, of course, we're mostly siding with the Angels here. You got to lay a big number on them, probably a full, eh, well, only $2. That's not as high as you would otherwise think, given the given the matchup here. And that's probably because of the susceptibility for Josie Suarez to give it up a little bit to the righties. So um, if you want to take a, a deep sort of eight and a half to, to five punt on Oakland here today, I don't think this is horrific, but don't be surprised if Waldachuk gives up, you know, a six spot in the first two innings and, and you're just dead in the water. Um, so we like the angels. You're going to have to get different with them. Just keep an eye out for the ownership as we get later into the day. Kansas City and Arizona, Brad Keller, 7,500. Uh, yeah. um, it's not the greatest spot for him. Uh, the Diamondbacks here in the early going against righty has been pretty pretty sticky themselves. 20% K rate, 318 Woba, 170 ISO nearly. Nice, nice power numbers coming from the D-backs. 96 WRC+. Plus. So they haven't really been able to get on base at a high enough clip. Just a 6% walk rate. Now, they're stealing at the highest rate in baseball when they get on base. They have a lot of guys over here with a lot of speed. And Josh Rojas has Rojas has speed. Cattell Marte, he looks healthy. He certainly has speed. Corbin Carroll, probably with Trey Turner, the fastest two guys in, the, in baseball. Um, they've got some guys that can move up here. Alec Thomas, Jerry Perdomer, they can move down here at the bottom of the lineup as well. Paven Smith, Christian Walker, Lourdes Gurriel, not so much. Gabby, not behind the plate. Uh, but they have some guys that can really turn the lineup over here. And if they can get on base and increase this on base percentage, it's going to make them very difficult to deal with. Uh, they're, they're really aware, uh, are the D-backs, that they don't have a hell of a lot of power upside in the lineup. And really, only a couple of guys that can hit the ball over the wall with any regularity. So they're going to have to figure out a way to create runs, and that's how they're going to do it, is by stealing bases and putting a lot of pressure with their young athletes on opposing starters. And Brad Keller, he may very well be putting a lot of guys on base tonight, not necessarily because of walks, although a 10% walk rate is is notable for sure. It's mostly contact and the lack of raw swing and miss stuff for Keller. 17% K rate and a full 80% contact rate. This is a good target spot for the D-backs. And as a cheaper stack, they're a, a reasonable tournament play here. Now, we got to keep an eye on their ownership, of course. Um, however, I think there's probably going to be a good bit of value to try and eke out of the D back, they could get on, they could steal five bases tonight, uh, very reasonably if they're if they're on base, um, and they're a threat to do that every single game, and that's a lot of points that you can eke out of your stack there. So reasonable construction over here for the D backs, probably going to see, as I mentioned, some some big ownership on them. Uh, the batted ball numbers for Keller are still fine. I generally don't like stacking against Keller. Um, and I think this is an okay price tag. It maybe looks a little high for this particular matchup uh, at 7,500, but it's not bad by by any means. Very low ownership here. So if you want to take a shot on 15, 18 per points or so, um, Keller certainly has it in the tank. And we've seen it, I think, in his last couple of starts. He may have gotten beat up in his last start. 
uh, he did by Texas, but he still went four innings, only gave up three runs. He just didn't strike any, strike anybody out. He walked five guys, so it elevated the pitch count. Uh, the start before that, however, against Texas again, he went six and two thirds and struck out seven. So we did talk about the sort of back-to-back starts for starters against the same lineup, and that's kind of why Texas was the preferred side in that scenario. Um, here, however, the D-backs have, have most of these guys probably never seen Keller, so I think it's an interesting tournament spot here to go to him at sub-5% ownership. Nobody's going to be playing him. He does have trouble throwing strike one, and that's why it makes him so difficult to play on the mound a lot of the time and what keeps the strikeout rate down he if he were able to get ahead in more counts he could go to this slider it's an okay pitch for him the curveball is an okay pitch the changeup is fine he's just throwing too many fastballs and he can't throw them for a strike early in the count which puts him into a lot of trouble so um i think there's pretty high upside here for the d-backs t- tonight to to get on base and, and really start running around uh, they've got pop and if they start circling the bags, uh, this team can put up 10 runs in, in this spot, uh, I think, in a good few scenarios. So I like the D-backs on offense quite a bit, probably less so on the Keller for me personally. But uh, if you're building a lot of teams, I think it's warranted to have um, some exposure here. If he, if he only comes in 1%, 2% or something, you know, you, you can play five Keller teams and get some leverage. Um, not that it's all that much, but... It's uh, it's it's greater than zero. Tommy Henry's coming up for the D-backs. They're they're gonna give him another spot start here. Um, another one of these young arms that has okay stuff, but it, like he's he's got a workable four pitch arsenal here. Um, it's just that nothing is overpowering just yet. He doesn't have any velocity, only throwing 92. So he's kind of a soft tossing lefty here. Pitches to a lot of contact and also has trouble throwing strikes. Similar to Dre Jamison yesterday, he's got like a 12% first pitch strike rate or something just egregious. And these guys, they can make it to the big leagues, but they're not going to be able to stick in the big leagues if you cannot get ahead of hitters and put yourself in equitable counts. And we're seeing that same uh, pattern here with Tommy Henry in his his abbreviated outings so far. He's been giving up a lot of power so he, he's not throwing a hell of a lot of strikes early in the count. He's not throwing it by anybody. We mentioned the velocity, just 91, 93, but giving up a ton of contact. 78% is not a, a super worrying number necessarily, but it's very hard contact. He's on the barrel at a full 9%, 37% hard contact to the right side, 41 to lefties. This is a very small sample, but... Still worrisome, absolutely, and that's because of the lack of a good fastball here. He's throwing it pretty straight. Slider doesn't have any swing and miss either, and the changeup that he would normally use to keep righties off balance uh, also doesn't have any any swing and miss in it. So curveball is the only serviceable pitch that would give him a little bit more uh, maneuverability against left-handers and some against righties, I suppose, too. But um, overall, his other three pitches at a full, I mean, this is 85% of his arsenal with the four-seamer slider change, uh, are really not very good. So you can also get to the Royals on the other side. And some of the righties, notably a Bobby Witt, Salvi Perez, um, who have strikeout problems, and chase rate problems, and notably with Salvi, he's got one of the higher chase rates in the in baseball. Um, those are some decent targets here for us today. I like Eddie Olivares. He's a, a very reasonable target here at, I believe, still a pretty cheap price tag. Yeah, 3200 for him today. Uh, Salvi's 48 plenty playable. Not sure why we don't have a, a Franny price here for the Royals. Um over here on labs, but there's occasionally some shenanigans over here on labs lineup page. Um, but Matt Duffy, he's a cheap filler piece for you here as well. He's got a couple of doubles in the bat left still. Uh, Hunter Dozier has pop, but uh, not a lot of upside for him um, in general. You could, And Vinny hits lefties perfectly fine. Certainly a straight 
and and marginal fastball from Tommy Henry is an attackable pitch. So uh, we can go after the Royals here too. They're going to come in at markedly lower ownership than the D-backs. If you want to stack this game here, yeah, go ahead. Uh, probably close the roof, I would guess, today uh, in, in Arizona. But who knows? They may open it. It is only 90 degrees, not 110. So... Um, a lot of, lot of offensive upside here in this game tonight, and naturally you're seeing, a, you know, what, you got to lay $1.30 on the D-backs, uh, but you're getting plus money on the Royals right now, and I think that's, it's very reasonable that they could win this game. If, you wanna, you, if this pops up to buck ten, buck fifteen, plus money on the Royals, I think you could take a shot there uh, into betting markets. Um, and certainly in DFS, these, these prices are attainable. 51 for Bobby Witt looks pretty attractive here tonight. So uh, probably no pitching in most scenarios on the mound for me here, and mostly offense. Let's get to the last game. We're going really long here. Jordan Montgomery, 9,500 on the mound for him. We talked about the price tag. It's elevated, and we don't really want to be doing that. And the Giants here, they can platoon. Um, they're going to be probably putting up... a, a a few more runs on average over here in San Francisco, even though the ballpark is large, the bases are shorter. It's not that they're going to be stealing bases necessarily, but it's going to provide more offense. In general, um, guys are going to be able to, to beat out singles and beat out double plays and, and things like that. It's, just, it, it's not a huge difference here uh, in San Francisco, but it can matter. And we're seeing here in the early going, certainly in day games, ball, baseball flies over in San Francisco in, in the smaller yard um, compared to several seasons ago. But in the night games, too, there, there's still some potential to see some offensive output from games down here. Now, it's still, whatever, 50 freaking degrees in San Francisco, 60 degrees in San Francisco. 60 is much better. Um, but tonight... I'm, I'm not sure that I want to be going after some Jordan Montgomery on the mound with outsized proportions. Uh, the Giants are going to be a little bit better against lefties. They've been awful so far, 285 PA so far. 31% uh, strikeout rate against the left side. It's just a 6% walk rate. So they're not all that patient over here, and that that's giving them some pretty serious problems. They, they have plenty of righties that they can platoon with, Tyro's actually been pretty good. Not sure he warrants a $5,500 price tag. Wilmer Flores, historically an excellent, very consistent hitter. J.D. Davis has popped. Aaron Ruff has popped. David Villar has popped. Uh, Joey Bart probably will get a start tonight behind the plate. Plenty of pop as well. Um, now, these guys are still going to strike out. So it's an okay fundamental spot for Jordan Montgomery. I'm worried about the price tag. And the ownership, I think, looks fine at 15 16 percent give or take right now uh, i think all of this looks okay uh, i'm really not wild about the price in general because he's only got a 20 percent k rate to the right side and they can put six righties in the lineup against him tonight um and that's a little bit worrisome they'll still make some contact as we've seen over the last week or so they've been markedly better than these early numbers against lefties suggest so um i'm okay getting to some montgomery i think the medium projection looks fine He's still a good arm. He's still elite against the left side. They did bring Jock back last night. Um, Yaz, I'm not sure if they'll play him tonight, but uh, they've got some of their more staple lefties. They may keep in the lineup. That strike out a lot. and They're definitely not um, all that thrilled about playing them uh, against left-handed starters. So um, would probably side... Oh, geez, I don't know. Uh, maybe with some of the Giants, if uh, if Montgomery's ownership steams here a little bit, but I'm overall pretty off of offense, I think. I, I, def, I certainly respect Montgomery's arm over here, and he can, just because the, the strikeout rate is low and the ISO is pushing 170 against the right side, he's still got a 1.4 ground ball to fly ball uh, to the righties, 2.5 to lefties or whatever. Um and the hard contact number is fine. He's not inducing enough soft contact to be overly thrilled with it. So I think that's probably why I would come off the $9,500 price tag um, and most likely side with the Giants. I, I do like a very cheap Wilmer Flores here. Unfortunately, you got to play him at first base, um, and you can't play both he and Darren Ruff. 
So you got to make some decisions down here if you get down there. But J.D. Davis has plenty of pop, 3900 Not wild about the price, but you can still get to some of these righties, maybe as you know, one-off pieces or something like that. Um, I think getting 15 to 20 Jordan Montgomery teams is fine, but I'm not overly thrilled. Might would probably come in under this number, to be honest. I don't like the price tag. Alex Cobb on the other side, 8900 for him. Uh, median projection and ownership so far look fine. And you're naturally going to see low ownership projections and median point projections against the Cardinals. And th as they start to heat up and we get into the summer here, um, lineup is, has been a lot better. Saw them get after Chris Flexen yesterday. Really isn't all that difficult. But um, Alex Cobb's got a huge ground ball rate. One of the higher rates in baseball at a full three to one here. And he stays off the barrel, doesn't walk people, has strikeouts. So we generally like that. Now the Cardinals uh, here in the early going against righty, still producing and creating a little bit. 109 WRC plus, 151 ISO. So not a lot of power just yet, but hitting the baseball hard, slightly lower ground ball to fly ball rate than you'd really be overly concerned with. You know, if this is up at 1.4, with a 35% hard contact rate, you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, but as we inch down closer to a neutral ground ball to fly ball rate, that makes them more playable. And we see that sort of reflected here in the line drive rate, 23.5%. This is a big aggregate number for a team. And they're hitting for some average. 261, we're seeing that start to climb over the last week or so. 22% K rate with a 10% walk rate. So still very dangerous lineup. And very hard to get through with Goldschmidt, Arenado. Um, plenty of flexibility with their younger hitters as well. Lars is back healthy. They are almost certainly just going to lead him off against lefties, excuse me, against righties from the left side all season. Alec Burleson, they've had him as the staple in the two hole all year as well. And Nolan Gorman, who have, they have mixed in, um, he has plenty of pop. I believe he hit in the two yesterday, two or the three, something like that. Um, Wilson Contreras has, of course, always been a, a very good hitter. Not a good matchup, of course. Um, so we don't want to go after the righties here because Alex Cobb is pretty damn good against the right side. 101 ISO with a 298 Wobe and a 26% K rate. They'll hit for some average. 272 ice, average to lefties, 266 to the right side. Um, but again, it's a very high ground ball rate with some strikeouts. You, Gets ahead of hitters, puts himself in very equitable count. So I think this is an interesting tournament spot for Alex Cobb as well. 8900 also an elevated price tag. Not wild about that. Um, I think if I had to choose, it'd be like, give me Alex Cobb. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then, then the Cardinals, then the Giants, then or then or something like that. I don't know. It's it's an interesting tournament game here. I think you can play. Some pieces from both sides. Not my favorite for stacks. Probably side mostly with the pitching on the mound because it's really good. And this is still San Francisco. Um, I like Alex Cobb the most, I think, though. At 8900 this is a playable price tag on a seven-game slate and a playable ownership number at 13% so far. I think just we could probably get some north of 20% here. I, I don't think that's bad considering the other options we've got on the mound here. So um, still not my favorite for stacks, but they're they're playable if you want to get to them. Okay, that's the that's it for the breakdown. Pretty long here today, I think. I feel like I talked for a while. Um, nevertheless, we'll, uh, we'll go over stacks once again. Uh, prefer mostly pitching in the early game here. Lance Lynn, Chris Bassett. Side with the White Sox, I think, in both, in both cases. Um on the mound and in the batter's box. Give me Atlanta, pretty much top to bottom here. Maybe a Luis Arise hedge piece or something, uh, or a Jazzy. It's, he is right-handed pitching very well. Give me, give me the Tigers. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but uh, I think they might win a baseball game tonight uh, here against Brewers. Uh, I like Matt Boyd a little bit. 6,600. I think that's a playable price tag. Yankees in Minnesota. Yeah, probably siding mostly with pitching here. Uh, it, it's still just 45 degrees in Minnesota. I wish they put a damn roof on that stadium. It, like, getting pretty irritating doing this every single year. Um, you can play the Yankees pretty much whenever. Like, they have enough upside. 
missing Stanton, missing Donaldson saps their power a little bit. But then they've been striking out a little bit, so you can play Sonny Gray on the other side too. Not crazy about getting to the Twins here. Uh, they've been so bad. Um, and they're seeing Johnny Brito again, who they got to a couple. Of, I'd most likely side with Brito here. Angels pretty much only. Uh, maybe some A's pieces. You can get to Jose Suarez a little bit. KC and Arizona like offense almost exclusively in this game. Uh, maybe some deep tournament pieces just because of the price tags on Keller and Henry, though. St. Louis and San Francisco also mostly just pitching, I think, and probably just some one-offs. So some obvious spots here today, I think. Strider, Atlanta, uh, Angels, KC and Arizona. So you can get different. And you're going to have to get different. Maybe get to the White Sox. Maybe play some Tigers, something like that. Um, but get different with it and, and play around on these seven-game slates. So that's pretty much it. We're not going to go over the turbo slate because since I talk so much. But uh, good luck, guys. Keep an eye out for the projection updates as we will continue pushing them throughout the day.